Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to the Agile World Podcast, where we discuss customer experience, employee experience, and transformation in an agile age. The Agile World Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed on this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Center of Experience, a blueprint for creating an experience-led organization, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile World podcast. Today, we're going to talk about corporate social responsibility, or CSR, and its role in employee and customer experience. Both employees and consumers are increasingly motivated to support companies who share their values. Whether this is the company that employees choose to work for or companies that customers choose to buy from, the values and initiatives a company supports holds a lot of importance. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome John Friedman, Sustainability Manager at WGL, also a fellow author and an expert on the subject of corporate social responsibility. So first, why don't you tell me a little bit about your career and your involvement in CSR? Hey, Greg. First of all, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like to be honest, and so I'm going to say that my career in CSR really happened by accident. Yeah. My background's in corporate communications, and one of my roles was helping to launch a reorganization of, an, of a company. And after it was successful, and they had thought that it was going to fail, they then handed me the next project that was supposed to fail, oh. <laughs> which was the sustainability program, which was coming from a parent company in, in Europe. That was also a success, but in the course of this, I kind of found my passion. And so now I like to say I live at the intersection of communication and corporate responsibility strategy, helping companies to live their values and engage in authentic conversation. That's great. And you also have a book. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually very pleased that uh, a book is coming out. Uh, it should be out now, but if it's not, it'll be out shortly from Business Expert Press. It's called Managing Sustainability from First Steps to First Class. It's everything I've learned in the last 20 years, except what the editors removed. <laughs> but uh, I think it would be a very useful uh, book in this space for people who are starting out, but also for people who are looking to get to the place of where CSR has evolved to today, which is a lot further than it was back in the year 2000 when we were talking about energy efficiency and solely focusing or ex mostly focusing on the environment. Great, great. Yeah, definitely check that out. So let's start with the question of why organizations should uh, support uh, CSR and, and sustainability initiatives. So, you know, beyond potential good press, um, you know, what, what are the real tangible benefits of embracing uh, corporate social responsibility? Well, I think a good press and good reputation is important. But, you know, people often say, well, what is the danger of not being a responsible company? Yeah. An irresponsible company, and we've seen time and time again, whether it's environmental social or governance, organizations that don't follow the highest standards find themselves in trouble, whether it's with their regulators, whether it's with their customers, sometimes it's with their suppliers, and increasingly with their employees who are becoming much more active, particularly as we're seeing the generational shift to Generation Z that's now in the workplace, who are insisting and trying to find organizations that match their values when they choose an employer, but then holding them to that standard. And as anyone knows, if your employees are not on board with your business proposition, mm. you don't have one. Yeah. Um, I always say the employees are the first stakeholders you have to engage because if, they're, if they understand the purpose of the organization more than just making money, but the true purpose, the value it brings to people, then they live that in their everyday interactions with people, whether it's at the organization or when they're just talking to their friends about where they work. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you know, Gen Z and, and millennials. Have you seen, um, you know, they're not just Gen Z and millennials to combined or not some, you know, just a monolithic thing. You know, what are the differences that you're seeing between, you know, the values that Gen Z has as they're, I know they're really just starting to enter the workplace, but, um, you know, what, what are kind of some of the differences that you're seeing? I think it's very easy to underestimate the power of what a generation can do to a workplace. My dad is a traditionalist, right? Suit, tie. And I'm not wearing a suit and tie right. today. And I just came from the office. I haven't worn a suit and tie with the exception of important meetings with external stakeholders in years. Yeah. But 
for him, the idea was you had to dress a certain way in order to, you have to dress like a professional, look professional, dress for success. Right. And my generation coming to the workplace shattered that. And so every generation brings its culture and its values. And so the new generations that are in the workplace, and you're right, they're not monolithic. In fact, most of them hate to be referred to by these generational slices right. that we baby boomers have attributed to right, them. Right. But the fact is people have always wanted more from their employer or you know, than just a paycheck, whether it's my father who wanted a career and, you know, a retirement package at the end. And obviously some of those things and that social contract has been changed. But increasingly you're seeing people who are using their values when they choose which employer, sometimes over the amount of compensation. And that is an artifact of both the fact that these generations are coming up with these values and are being encouraged and inspired with these values, but also because right now we've been blessed in the U.S. in particular with record high employment. Yeah. And as a result, people have their choice of where they choose to bring their time, their talent, and their treasure, and they've been taught that they can do that. Yeah. So how does a company decide what um, initiatives to focus on? I mean, given the diversity, given, you know, there's so many things to choose from, you know, what, what would that be based on? And what, you know, what are kind of the, the rationales that, that go into that? Well, starting in a philosophical sense, what I've, and this is actually covered a little bit in the first part of my book, is to find your purpose. Yeah. So I encourage organizations to stop looking at what they make and thinking about what they do in the world. I said earlier that my, you know, I didn't go into my title. I said, I help companies to live their values and engage in authentic conversation. That's the value proposition. And so I encourage organizations to really look at how does do the goods you create or the services you provide, how do those impact people in their daily lives? That gives you a sense of your purpose. So I've worked for a number of companies. I worked for a construction materials company, but we weren't focused or the languaging that I put behind it was we're not responsible for making this product, this product, and this product. Mm. We build safe homes. Mm. We build schools. We build the hospitals where your children are born, the houses of worship where they may one day get married, and the offices where they'll work, and the roads to get between those places. It's a, it, it sounds a little bit more esoteric and a little bit more theoretical, but that's where you find your purpose. At your purpose then helps define your values as a company. So what that turned into was if we, the first sign, line is we build homes for people. That led to a strategic philanthropy partnership with Habitat for Humanity oh, yeah. because it builds homes for people, right? right? Yeah. It, and it seems like a natural fit. That's the strategic philanthropy model. But then you start to look at, we're a major employer. It was a large company. It was in 70 or so countries around the world. If you have that many people in your organization, how do you become a preferred employer? Right. Well, recognizing and respecting and embracing diversity and inclusion is one way because if people feel like this is a place that I don't fit in, it's where I don't belong, they're not going to want to go work there. Right. So if you are, um, it's, it's a building materials company, construction, largely male dominated. So if you wanted to be a place that attracted women to come work there because you recognize that 51% of the qualified people on the planet are women, right, right. you have to create an environment and an atmosphere where they can come, not as a token, but to bring their best, their whatever talents or training that they have and their passion to the workplace yeah. in a place where they can feel free to express that. And yeah. that's kind of where you talk about when I mentioned not wearing a suit and tie. We've gotten away from that. You know, my organization, I run the telework program. And I injured my leg earlier this year and I told my boss, hey, I'm really not supposed to be on my foot. And she said, okay, work from home when you can or work in the office that's physically closest to your house so you don't have to get on the train and deal with buses and all that. And uh, she gave me a little thing to put my foot up and right. didn't care if I couldn't wear my you know, nicer pants because they didn't fit around the cast. Right. You may say that's diversity and inclusion, but that's accepting the fact that meeting me where I was and it's what I needed so I could get the job done. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and all of this stuff also touches on, you know, the external facing brand. You know, we've, we've talked a bit about the the employee experience, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the customer experience as well. So, you know, as more and more organizations are competing based on experience, um, I think the statistic is something like 70 to 80% of companies now really believe their, their primary differentiation is experience. How does that translate to, you know, to their values, to CSR, to sustainability? 
how do you, you know, how do you take what works well on the inside and, and translate it to the outside? I think if you've empowered your employees to live your values and live your brand, and it really comes to it about empowering them. Have you you've ever had a retail experience where you ask somebody to accept a return and they have to go get their manager? That's not an empowered employee. Yeah. But an employee that's empowered to give you a good experience gives you a good experience. And that enables you to, as a customer, to appreciate and see the values in action. It, you know, a poster on the wall doesn't express values. All companies live their values. The trick is they may not be the ones on the wall. If your value is to respect and empower your employees and your employees aren't, you know, tell you, I, I can't handle that. I have to go get my manager or I have to get an approval. Right. I don't care how big the, and beautiful the poster is behind them that says, we empower our employees. Right. <laughs> it's the disconnect between what companies say and the way that it expresses. And that's why I talked about authentic conversations because people see through falseness very well. With all the talk about things like fake news, most people know when it's, when, when, they're, when someone's blowing smoke or just saying something to sound good. You can feel it when you're there, when you're interacting. I'm sure anyone listening can recall a time where they were just frustrated by customer service. But understand that that customer service representative was probably every bit as frustrated as you were. Yeah. So how do you, um, how do you ensure, what do you do about that lack of engagement then? You know, so, you know, you have that employee that, again, the writing's on the wall, literally, <laughs> and, um, and yet they're not really, you know, the employee's not feeling it, thus the customer's not feeling it. You know, what do you, what do, you do about that? How do you energize employees around these initiatives? I, I think energizing employees around the initiatives is sort of second. The first thing is to actually live those values, to empower that employee. Don't just tell them, we're going to empower you. Do it. If, you know, your employees are your brand, I would argue that it doesn't matter how expensive or wonderful your PR campaign is. Captain Hazelwood controlled the Exxon brand when he ran a rank, well, he stepped away from the bridge and allowed his tanker to run into the Bly Reef and cause the Exxon Valdez oil spill. There's not a PR campaign. There's not a poster. There's not a TV ad that's going to overcome that in a short period of time. Right. You know, it took 20 years for them to recover that reputation. And so understanding that your employees, whether you empower them or not, are your brand ambassador. So I always start with the, what do you really want your employees to do? How do you want them to manifest this? Yeah. And if you are serious about it, you empower your employees. And so it's sometimes you get the walk ahead of the talk. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think I, that goes with branding in general too. Is you know you want you want it to if it's natural, it will kind of already exist, and you're really just putting something into whether it's you know words, pictures that already kind of exist. So I think you know making that making that genuine really um, it, it makes it stronger and more long lasting. Um, are there times where uh, a company should be less vocal about um, its initiative. So, you know, again, there is there is good PR opportunity. There's a great opportunity to talk about it to customers and, um, you know, customers that share those values uh, certainly uh, will, will like that. But, you know, when would a company want to be less vocal about um, some of their initiatives? From, from my experience, companies, uh, and there are companies that are just naturally recalcitrant. They, they have this attitude that you do good, but you don't brag about it because it makes it somehow less good. And I once worked um, for the ad council and the head of the ad council was a great guy named Bob Kime, who's since passed, but he said, good, the more oft communicated, the more abundant grows. Mm -hmm. And so there is a value to talking about it. But the issue is if we talk about it ahead of what you're actually doing, uh, unless you use aspirational language, we are endeavoring to do this. We are working toward this. If you get ahead of yourself, then those become the disconnects. Yeah. When you start talking about you know, how much you're reducing your emissions or your waste or something, well, that creates the expectation that you're doing it and also creates the opportunity if you've fallen down on that for someone to point that out. Yeah. So, But again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, I would prefer my internal employees to be the canary in the coal mine to say, hey, you know, we're not living this value as well as we should be. 
But, you know, the public, that, that's a value to that, that pushback, that question. You know, and it, it, it runs into it and companies are seeing this. We're seeing this with employee activism right now where employees are literally walking out of their employer because whether it's Amazon and the employees uh, who think they're not doing enough for the climate or the Wayfair incident oh. where the employees – and it was about 30 percent of their employees. So two-thirds of the employees were not involved in this, but a third of their employees felt the need or compelled to walk out because they didn't want their products to be used in the detention centers along the southern border where children were being kept separate from their families. Yeah. And and that got a lot of attention because of a disconnect between what the company said its values were, and it was a perfectly legal contract, but people are holding their own organizations to a higher standard. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, not just if your communication gets ahead of it, I think in that case, they didn't do a good job communicating with their employees why they were doing it. And maybe the employees still would have walked out and it's not up to me to, or you or anyone to decide if it's right or wrong uh, writ large, but is it right or wrong for you? Would you go work there or would you invest if it was a publicly traded company? Right. And that's the choice we get. We get to vote with our feet, not just with our wallets. Yeah. And if it's clearly communicated, at least you get that. There, there's that real opportunity to to act on it and, and be intentional about it, I, I think. So what's a um, what's a brand that you think is doing it well? You know, that's that's not only their values are clearly articulated, but they seem to be living it, not only their employees, but their customers. You know, there's that uh, symbiosis, so to speak, of of, you know, of a brand doing it well. Obviously, we're going to talk about Unilever yeah. because they have made their sustainable living plan and their sustainable offerings the cornerstone of who they are. And they you know, released studies that show that this is these are the fastest growing segments of their market. Clearly, their customers, therefore, are rewarding this. Their employees are engaged on it. But you don't have to be as big as a Unilever to do it. So there's other companies that are doing it, and they're doing it maybe more quietly or behind the scenes. And some of them are B2B companies, which don't directly face a consumer. I used to work for Sodexo, and the company is doing remarkable things to reduce food waste, to reduce carbon emissions for diversity and inclusion. Now, they're known for the diversity and inclusion stuff, but a lot of the food waste stuff is back of the house. Customers don't see it. And we created a program when I was there to bring it forward so that the clients, which is the people, it's a B2C, okay. uh, B2B rather, the clients could see it and then show it to the customers who, in, in this case, a lot of them were college students who wanted to know what the company was doing and what their college was doing. So nice. companies yeah. are doing it. Um, UPS is doing some remarkable things around their fleet and transportation, reducing the emissions of their trucks whether it's switching to electric vehicles or even pedal-powered vehicles in the cities, oh. using natural gas-fueled vehicles for the longer distances where electric is not as efficient. Right. And right. you know, really looking at their fleet and, and, and serving as a mobile laboratory, that's the phrase they use, hmm. um, to figure out what are the right transportation solutions for, for their company. And, of course, they're famous for, in sustainability circles, for eliminating left turns. Oh. In the cities, they drive into the center and then kind of move in an outward car. Uh, corkscrew, or I shouldn't say corkscrew when I'm <laughs> driving, should I? Right, right. A spiral. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and this is only in right drive countries. In left drive countries, it's the opposite. But the point was, they felt that uh, they knew that something like 60 to 70% of accidents are left hand turns. So it was done as a safety and efficiency. Mm. You can make a right on red, you can't make a left on red. But it discovered it reduced their fuel. As I said, it reduces their ac accident rate. And so it's their kind of logistics around transportation within cities, and they've continued it on to this day of looking at alternative fuels for their vehicles. Nice, that's great. So, from a from an employee engagement um, standpoint, you know what what does success look like? I mean, you may you may not get a hundred percent employee engagement, but you know what's a realistic expectation that uh, that employers should have? Employee engagement, like I mentioned, it's key, right? Yeah. And uh, I've I've done a lot relating to it. I'm very proud of the fact here, at WGL. We do an employee uh, engagement survey, and this last year, again, corporate responsibility was the number two most pride point or the most well, that measured by how people who said the company did a good job at that. So, you know, great. I'm not patting myself on the back, but... Oh, you should. <laughs> no, well, but the thing is, it's not mine. It's everyone in the company. I may be the manager of sustainability and running some of the efforts, but the point is they've embraced it, and that's, that's where it is. And it was second to safety. 
which is one, which I would argue is a corporate responsibility. Right. But you, they saw that as something that we were living and, and breathing every day. So that was very exciting. Yeah, it, it leads me to a, a fascinating story because you know, a lot of times you give out these surveys and back in the old days of paper surveys and filling them out, right. you know, people wanted to get a high response rate. And they would do things to get high response rates like fill out the survey, we'll give you a pizza, what have you. But a high response rate, if it's artificially created, doesn't mean that employees are really engaged yeah, yeah. because when when employees feel comfortable responding they feel like the information they give is going to be used to make their lives better they do respond yeah. and one of my favorite stories is i worked in a place where we had a 100 percent response rate so you think okay we're going to go there and, and and recognize them these are the employees who care the most about the organization but and as i said these were mailed in single surveys hand filled out you know fill in the bubble chart we obviously didn't do handwriting and 100% response rate 100% is great. It's huge. It's like, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. What are we doing right? But then every single survey was blank. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I'd never seen anything like that before. It was my first employee opinion survey. And we were working with a, a vendor that was helping us do the survey. And what we refer to that as, it was the silent scream. Because for every employee to do the same thing, 100% of the employees, we knew that they were being compelled to fill it out. Yeah. But Somewhere along the lines, someone had to have organized and orchestrated that response, the non-response response. So we knew there was a problem up there, yeah. and it was a lack of tr trust in the local management. Mm. Because if they didn't trust that we would use the information to make their lives better, or they didn't trust that it would be anonymous, they were afraid to fill out the survey. And so uh, the leadership team and I went up there, and we talked to the people, and we determined that's exactly what the problem was. And it resulted in us making a management change. Yeah. And the interesting thing is not only the next year did we get a great response rate from them uh, without compelling them to do it, they actually filled out the survey. Wow. Oh, that's good. Uh, and were happier and they felt like they'd been listened to and respected. And they felt that way because they had been. It's yeah. walking the talk. It's, it's being authentic about it. It's not pretending. Yeah. But the financials from that d unit had actually improved. And that's often the difference because you'll see a situation where somebody – doesn't live the values, but puts the numbers on the bottom line. Right. And, and Jack Welch talks about how those are the most dangerous people in your organization because they undermine the culture because management is tempted to reward them or keep them around yeah. because they can hit the bottom line numbers, which of course matter. Right. And so he, he used to uh, fire those people. Yeah. I mean, culture <laughs> is, you know, I mean, it's a lot of things, but I mean, it's also how decisions are made and it's what's, what's valued and what's rewarded. Right. So when simply like checking the box is rewarded, there's going to be those people that just kind of do that. Fortunately, not everyone is like that, but it doesn't, it doesn't make for a strong culture. It just makes for a culture of maybe compliance at most, but yeah. Well, and compliance is never leadership. Right. Because if, if you say, well, we're going to follow the law or follow the regulations, then if you think that's a leadership position, you are assuming that every single one of the other competitors in your marketplace is not obeying the law. Yeah. So counting on your competitors' malfeasance is not a business strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree. <laughs> So uh, one last question before we wrap up, um, you know, for those that are interested in um, becoming a CSR or sustainability leader in their own organization, um, where would you suggest they start? I think it, it, it depends on what your industry is, but there are a lot of resources out there. Of course, you want me to say, and so I guess I will, that I you know, there's this like great book coming out. out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a great book on managing sustainability from first steps to first class coming from businessexpertpress.com. It, it may be out. I, I'm a little bit unsure of the uh, publishing. Uh, last I checked, we were still tweaking, uh, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and uh, getting all the footnotes right. Yeah. You can hit me on uh, Twitter, at John Friedman, uh, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. But there are, there are organizations that are out there, BSR, Business for Social Responsibility, Sustainable Brands. They host conferences. They offer webinars. And there's, there's a bunch of them out there to really figure out uh, and, and start getting involved in it. I, I encourage people to do it because for me, you know, right now where I sit is in the business strategy department and helping develop the strategy for a business. I'm not in the marketing or the PR department. We're looking at what is the long range business model for our organization to be successful in 
tw- up to 2050. We're looking at a thir- we're working on it now on a 30 year plan. Yeah. And the idea is to have and incorporate these things in it. I mean, that's, that's where it's at. And if you're interested in making this world a better place and leveraging the power of business to do social and environmental good, uh, it's a great way because if you find a profitable way to do that, it yeah. just becomes a virtuous cycle. Well, in doing a uh, I, I, thirty-year plan these days, sounds like pretty, f- you know, thinking far, far out. Right? It's more than the quarter, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems like you know at most a company's looking a few years out or something like that, maybe five years or something. So that's that's really that's really interesting looking thirty years out. Well, the interesting, yeah, you know, we jo- we joke it's a plan for a plan. Yeah. It's a structure and a framework by which we will evaluate new opportunities for our business. Yeah, and we've put in place what we think. It will look like, but we also understand that, you know, our world is moving at the speed of technology right. and somewhere right now in a garage, somewhere in this world, somebody is putting together that whatever that either becomes a great opportunity or a tremendous threat to my company. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. You, you can only project so far out, right? Right. So, right. But yeah. if someone invents the, the better mousetrap tomorrow, then this strategy is flexible enough to say, we're going to go for the better mousetrap yeah. based on these parameters and whether in this case it's climate redu- uh, impact reduction, cost affordability, you know, scalability or what, what, what your parameters are, ability to, del- to deliver it. Because, you know, we've all seen that great nifty product, you know, let's look at the Tesla Model S, which was over $100,000. Well, that was brilliant and wonderful and I've driven it and it's amazing, but at that price point, you're not going to be able to really go to scale. And that's where the Model 3 comes in. Right, right. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, uh, John Friedman from G- WGL, thanks for joining the show. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate it. Nice to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to learn more about both customer and employee experience, I recommend you go to my website, gregkilstrom.com. Make sure to check out my latest book, The Center of Experience. More information is available on my website or wherever the book is available, like Amazon. Thanks for listening to The Agile World with Greg Kilstrom. See you next week. Thanks again for listening to The Agile World podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Center of Experience, from my website at theagile.world or on Amazon or other retailers. Until next week, stay agile.